Get ahead of postage rate increases this year with Stamps.com. It's like your own personal post office. Sign up with promo code PROGRAM for a four-week trial plus free postage and a free digital scale. No long-term commitments or contracts. That's Stamps.com code PROGRAM. What if you could have a career where the opportunities are as vast as our nation, where it's not about mission statements, but a shared mission? At U.S. Customs and Border Protection, we go beyond to protect more than borders. From ship to shore, air to ground, cities to local communities, CBP agents and officers are keeping people safe. Join U.S. Customs and Border Protection and go beyond for something far greater than yourself. Learn more at cbp.gov careers. Hi, this is Scott. If you're a fan of the ancient world, please help us get the word out. Like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and rate the series on iTunes. Thanks again for listening. Though she knew next to nothing at the time, Thayer eventually learned the full story of Demetrius's exile and return. According to the historian Justin, it was at Cnidos, a Carian city at the tip of a small peninsula, that the sons of the doomed king Demetrius I found refuge from Alexander Ballas. And pretty much from the moment they landed, they'd started plotting their revenge. Now, Demetrius I had married his sister Laodice in 160 BC, and his eldest son, Antigonus, was already dead. So, doing the math, in 150 BC, Demetrius and Antiochus were only seven or eight. Which meant that, while their hearts might be in it, the actual planning was left to advisors. Likely the same members of their father's regime who'd helped them escape from Syria. Early on, the boys were separated, probably for their own protection. The older boy, Demetrius, was taken to Crete, which, as you may have gathered from Fizcon's intrigues, was basically a one-stop shop for Greek mercenaries. His advisors made contact with a commander named Lasthenes and paid him to assemble an army. Demetrius's younger brother, Antiochus, was sent to the Anatolian coastal city of Sidae. And while his older brother prepared his invasion, or, as he viewed it, dynastic restoration, Antiochus was forced to wait for news. But he wouldn't have to wait very long. In 147 BC, Thea and Alexander got word that Demetrius had launched his attack. And despite Alexander's preparations, it didn't come from the Mediterranean, but instead from the mountains of Cilicia which was pretty smart planning for a number of reasons. For one, it was far from Thea and Alexander's power base of Ptolemaeus. For another, the fact that Ptolemaeus was their power base meant the Antiochenes had felt snubbed by the new regime, and might be open to a rival claimant willing to restore their preeminence. For another, as Granger points out, Alexander's defensive measures had likely cost a pretty penny, one requiring heavy taxes on the wealthy northern cities. And lastly, there'd been that big earthquake the previous year, which had probably put everybody on edge and in a generally restless mood. So, yeah, Alexander was in pretty big trouble and needed to head up north right away. While the 20-year-old Seleucid king marched off toward Antioch with the bulk of his army, Thea remained behind in Ptolemais. Coel Syria and the Seleucid forces left in the region were entrusted to a governor named Apollonius Taus, who, the moment Alexander left, declared his open support for Demetrius II which meant the legitimists had spent their time laying some political groundwork, and some of that Seleucid gold had made its way down south. Suddenly, the 17-year-old Cleopatra Thea found herself trapped in enemy territory, 
while her husband was caught like a runner between bases, with legitimist forces ahead and behind. Fortunately, Alexander cultivated a regional ally who was perfectly poised to help. By 147 BC, Jonathan Maccabee was firmly established as Jewish high priest, master of Jerusalem, and effective ruler of Judea, with an army of 10,000 soldiers under his command. Most importantly, he was completely loyal to his patron, Alexander Ballas. Apollonius Taus had barely switched sides before he learned that Jonathan was marching against him. And after some initial jockeying for territory and advantage, a battle shaped up near Ashdod. Ashdod is one of those coastal cities just rife with ancient history, at least as far back as the 17th century BC. It always had a gift for rolling with the punches, and in 147, it was a thriving port under Seleucid control with a Hellenized Jewish population. It had no particular dog in this fight, but still found itself in the crosshairs. According to 1st Maccabees, Apollonius led 3,000 cavalry and several thousand infantry, and felt confident enough, despite their numbers, to mock Judean forces. But Jonathan withstood the Seleucid archers, waited until their cavalry was spent, then launched an attack on the infantry. His strategy worked, and Apollonius's forces were put to flight, with many seeking refuge in the nearby temple of Dagon. But Jonathan decided the time was ripe for a little biblical vengeance. As 1st Maccabees relates, Jonathan set fire to Ashdod and the cities round about it, and took their spoils. And the temple of Dagon, with them that were fled into it, he burned with fire. Thus were burned and slain with the sword well nigh eight thousand men. Jonathan's victory secured Coel Syria for Alexander Ballas, and allowed the king to focus on northern Syria. Before too long, Alexander suppressed a local uprising and re-established himself in Antioch, while his rival Demetrius pulled back to the mountains of Cilicia. So, Thea was safe in Ptolemais, Alexander was firmly entrenched in Antioch, and, well, their things just kind of sat. It was a virtual replay of Alexander's stalemate with Demetrius I, where neither side had sufficient strength to strike a decisive blow. Demetrius apparently had enough gold to keep his mercenary army in the field as a constant threat on Syria's northern border. But Alexander felt confident he could wait him out or defeat him if he came down south, so each side basically settled in and waited for the other to blink. Which is when Thea and Alexander got the news that Media and Elemius had been taken. Given the teaser at the end of last episode, you may have seen Media coming. After somehow managing to fend off the Parthians the previous year, the satrap Cleomenes was unable to withstand the second Parthian assault. Cleomenes may have had fewer troops, the Parthians may have brought more this time, or they may have learned and applied some lessons from the previous year's campaign. Either way, Thea and Alexander got word that all of Media including its ancient capital of Ecbatana, was now in the hands of the Parthians. For the moment, their king, Mithridates I, had paused at the Behestun Pass, either deterred by local Seleucid garrisons or looking to consolidate his gains. Which was pretty bad, but like I mentioned, there was also the loss of Elemius. And this one's kind of fun to unpack. Okay, so remember back in 187 when Antiochus the Great had tried to rob the Elemian Temple of Bel and ended up being killed by the locals? 
And remember in 164, when Antiochus IV had tried to rob the temple of Artemis Nanaya, and the locals had come to the temple's defense and convinced him to leave it alone? It's a decent chance that the guy who led the Elemians on one or even both occasions was a local chieftain named Kabneskir. Fending off Seleucid kings had given Kabneskir power and prestige, which had apparently only increased in subsequent years. And sometime during 147, he decided to make his move. The hated Seleucids, who tried to rob them, were preoccupied with civil war. And there were also rumors drifting south of the Parthians taking media. So, at around the same time, Kabneskir led Elemian forces in an attack on the city of Susa. You guys have probably heard me talk about Susa around a hundred times by now, especially since I mentioned it in my very first podcast episode. It's one of the oldest cities in the world, and served as the Elamite capital from the 3rd millennium BC onward. The city's name actually derived from the Elamite deity in Shushinak. After Ashurbanipal leveled Susa in 647 BC, it was rebuilt by the Persians under Darius I, and used as one of several Achaemenid capitals. It's also the site where Alexander the Great held mass weddings between Macedonians and Persians. As I mentioned in Bloodline episode B34, the Elemians claimed descent from the Elamites, which made conquering Susa a potent symbolic move. As I also mentioned, the Elemians rode into battle on camels and were known to be fearsome archers, while Seleucid forces were overstretched and racked by civil war. Before too long, the local garrison was expelled or killed, and Kabneskir captured the city. He then used Susa's mint to strike royal coins under the name Kamnazkaris I. It was unclear whether Elemian ambitions extended to neighboring territories, but then again, Murphy's Law was becoming the law of the land. Alexander clearly had to act, but... What the heck to do? Just like most Seleucid kings, he was afraid to head off in any direction since he might be attacked from another. But, if we're really being honest, Alexander knew exactly what he had to do. Thea probably told him as much. But as a young, proud Hellenistic king, he just really didn't want to do it. I mean, who wants to call your father-in-law to help bail out your kingdom? In 146 BC, the 39-year-old King Ptolemy VI was at the pinnacle of his power and influence. And though he may have preferred to govern remotely, he'd come to believe that Alexander Ballas just wasn't up to the job. Whether or not he was formally invited... Thea was likely relieved to learn that her father was on his way, and he wasn't coming alone. According to 1 Maccabees, Ptolemy gathered together a great host, like the sand that lieth upon the seashore, and many ships. And in 145, he landed at Ptolemaeus. The major cities along the coast were immediately garrisoned with Egyptian troops, which was mainly backfilling, when you consider the forces lost in Apollonius's revolt and those taken north by Alexander. First Maccabees notes a curious incident where the citizens of Ashdod, still angry over the devastation wrought by the Judean army, heaped up the burned bodies of their fellow citizens along the route that Ptolemy would pass. Basically saying, we'd really appreciate if you told Alexander to keep the Judeans reined in. But when Ptolemy met up with Jonathan at Joppa, the pharaoh chose to keep silent. Ptolemy marched north with the bulk of his army, likely with Thea at his side, and he also brought along Jonathan and the Judeans. But according to 1 Maccabees, 
Jonathan, when he had gone with the king to the river called Eleutheros, returned again to Jerusalem. Which is actually pretty interesting, and Granger does a bang-up job of sleuthing the motivations. As you may recall, the Eleutheros River was the traditional boundary between Coel Syria, controlled by Egypt, and Syria proper to the north. By investing cities with Ptolemaic troops, Ptolemy basically re-annexed Coel Syria, which may have been the price he demanded for helping Alexander. By sending Jonathan Maccabee back at the border, he was reinforcing that the Judeans were once again Ptolemaic subjects, and also saying that their help was no longer needed. Jonathan's army had earned a reputation for harsh treatment of Hellenized communities, a clear liability if Ptolemy was hoping to resolve things with minimal conflict. As for Jonathan, getting sent back home was likely taken for the insult it was. But given the apparent force disparity, there wasn't much he could do. With awkward incident number one behind us, let's proceed to incident number two. The Egyptian army arrived at Antioch, and Ptolemy and Thea were reunited with Alexander Ballas. So, I mean, yay, let's hash out a plan and take the fight to Demetrius. Except, according to First Maccabees, Ptolemy immediately imagined wicked counsels against Alexander which actually nails it pretty well, but here's the basic scoop. Ptolemy accused one of Alexander's chief advisors, a man named Ammonios, of trying to have the pharaoh assassinated back in Ptolemais. Which, yeah, this was the first that anyone had heard about it, including Thea, but really, who's going to call the pharaoh a liar? And when Alexander refused to hand his trusted advisor over to Ptolemy for punishment, well, Ptolemy announced that his daughter, Thea, was no longer married to Alexander. So, cue the reality show record scratch, because that is some real Housewives-level drama. Granger suggests that the whole confrontation was staged by Ptolemy to openly break with Alexander. He may have been disappointed in the quality of his kingship, what Diodorus Siculus calls Alexander's poverty of spirit. He may have been unconvinced that a victorious Alexander would accept his re-annexation of Coel Syria. Or he may have just felt that he'd have more leverage supporting the young Demetrius. Either way, the break was made, and... Regardless of Thea's personal wishes, she was suddenly back on the market. And, about 30 seconds later, back off it again. Because, wouldn't you know it, her father Ptolemy then offered her hand to Demetrius, who immediately, totally, fully accepted it, and the Ptolemaic support that came with. As for Alexander Ballas, he fled the city with his remaining supporters and went to seek refuge in Cilicia. On his way up north, he probably passed Demetrius coming down from the mountains, and they likely shared a head shake and a chuckle. Or not. So here's another weird little tidbit flagged by historian Warwick Ball. I mentioned that Thea and Alexander had had their first child, Antiochus, the previous year. And, though it's unclear exactly when or how, the couple apparently entrusted their son to a powerful local sheikh. Diodorus Siculus calls him Diocles, First Maccabees calls him Zabdiel, and Baal names him as Yamlikel, or Iamblichus. If that name sounds familiar to Bloodline fans, it's because the tribe to which Iamblichus belonged just happened to be known as the Emesenes. So this is the very first historical mention of the tribe that, around three and a half centuries later, would give us Julia Domna, Julia Mesa, and the Roman Severan dynasty. 
Alexander shipped off the royal infant the minute things got dicey, possibly when Demetrius first showed up. And while it may have seemed alarmist at the time, now it seemed veritably psychic. Even Thea, who may have protested, had to acknowledge the wisdom of the move. If he'd remained behind, the young Antiochus would have certainly been killed by Demetrius II. Or, in a darker version, by his very own grandfather, Ptolemy. There's no record describing the wedding of the 19-year-old Cleopatra Thea to the 13-year-old Demetrius II, though we can probably assume, for appearance's sake, it was a huge Ptolemaic affair. We have no real insight on Thea's take, though being used as a pawn in her father's intrigues couldn't have felt too wonderful. The funny thing was, even after the wedding, Demetrius wasn't immediately crowned, because Ptolemy was entertaining the prospect of just ruling Syria himself. Coel Syria was already his, and the north was essentially his for the taking. Nobody else had a comparable army, and Granger points out that, for the Antiochenes at least, Ptolemy was the only contender who could offer real peace and stability. He even had a pretty good claim. Through his mother, Cleopatra Syra, he was the grandson of Antiochus the Great. He could even say he was restoring the legitimate line after decades of dynastic conflict. Hell, given all that, he might even get my vote. But yeah, as usual, Rome. The previous year, 146 BC, was the year that Rome had utterly destroyed the cities of Corinth and Carthage, giving the Republic unprecedented control over Greece, Macedonia, and North Africa. With all their allies in Anatolia, and Rome and Fizcon on good relations, Rome could take any route they wanted to invade either Syria or Egypt. Ptolemy knew what had happened when Antiochus IV had tried something similar in 168. And diplomatic ties between Rome and Egypt had been severed in 162. All Rome needed was a little excuse, and Ptolemy was too seasoned a player to poke the wolf with a stick. So, yeah, no, Ptolemy was tempted, but in the end, he had Demetrius crowned. Though he offered to stick around for a bit and help put an end to Alexander. The former king had spent time and gold recruiting additional troops. And before long, he marched out of Cilicia to try to recover his throne. Ptolemy and Demetrius marched out to confront him. And the two sides met near the Enoparos River just northeast of Antioch. No matter how many mercenaries and loyalists he had, it's hard to imagine Alexander's forces being any kind of match for the Ptolemaic army, especially combined with the Cretan mercenaries and other loyalists of Demetrius. For Thea, of course, it was her ex-husband, and father of her only child, going up against her own father and her new young husband. So, cue the complex mix of emotions as she waited on news of the outcome. The news, when it came, was a very mixed bag. As expected, Alexander Ballas had been overwhelmed and quickly fled the field, leaving his credibility in tatters. But, as Granger reports, in the midst of the battle, Thea's father, King Ptolemy VI, fell off his elephant, was attacked by his enemies, and received a blow that fractured his skull. He returned from the battle alive but unconscious, with his fate in the hands of his doctors. Thea likely remained at his bedside until, three days later, he died. The 13-year-old Demetrius II, back from the battle alive and unharmed, was the unchallenged Syrian king. 
Once she was ready, Demetrius likely told his new wife the fate of Alexander Ballas. Along with a few loyalists, Alexander made his way to the Emocene camp and sought the protection of Iamblichus. But I should probably put loyalist in quotes, because two of Alexander's men contacted Demetrius and offered to kill him in exchange for a pardon. Demetrius agreed, and the deed was done. But there's zero mention of the infant boy, Antiochus. The assassins may not have known he was there, and Thea was apparently not talking. So, two dead kings in the space of a day. But what happened next was nearly as surprising. Because over the next few weeks, the Ptolemaic army abandoned Coel Syria. Demetrius may have given them a nudge. First Maccabees reports fighting in the cities, but mostly they returned on the orders of the new Egyptian king. What's that? A new Egyptian king? Well, actually, you know him pretty well. He's none other than our favorite 37-year-old Ptolemaic prince, not to mention Thea's uncle and former fiancé, King Ptolemy VIII, Physcon. For those of you who think I miscounted, I did indeed say Ptolemy VIII, not Ptolemy VII. And why is that? Well, because there already was a Ptolemy VII. He was the teenage son of King Ptolemy VI and his sister wife, Cleopatra II, which made him the younger brother of Cleopatra Thea. In fact, Thea had a few more siblings who I haven't really talked about. She had an older brother named Ptolemy Eupator, who'd been co-regent with her father for a bit, but had died seven years earlier on Cyprus. There was Ptolemy VII, the younger brother we're talking about. And lastly, there was the 13-year-old Cleopatra III, who'd soon give Thea a run for her money when it came to crazy lives. Ptolemy VII became king of Egypt the moment his father died. But about two seconds after hearing the news, Physcon approached Cleopatra II and proposed they get married and rule together, maybe even offering to make Ptolemy VII the future royal heir. Cleopatra didn't really have much choice. She knew how dangerous her brother could be, and likely reasoned that refusing his offer might lead to civil war. So, in the end, she relented. And, to give him credit, Fizcon waited all the way until the wedding banquet before having his nephew killed. So, Ptolemy Fizcon was king of Egypt. Though he had to shore up his new regime, one of the reasons he'd recalled Egyptian troops. He also may have just had no interest in annexing Coel Syria, or may have felt that trying to hold it might risk offending his ally, Rome. Either way, it was a tremendous boon to King Demetrius II, who was basically gifted a huge chunk of territory without having to lift a finger. Otherwise, Demetrius's biggest problem was the enormous debt to his Cretan mercenaries, and especially to their commander, Lasthenes. During their time together, Demetrius had come to view Lasthenes as something of a father figure. And it was likely Lasthenes who proposed the most direct approach, confiscating the fortunes of all the Antiochenes who'd supported Alexander Ballas. Demetrius agreed, and the process moved forward in a fairly aggressive manner. At the same time, according to Granger, at Lasthenes' demand, Demetrius discharged the garrison of Antioch and reduced the pay of the militia, all in an effort to transfer cash to the mercenaries. Given all this, it's unsurprising that riots soon broke out in the city, riots that threatened to overwhelm the fragile new regime. And for the second time, though on the opposite side, it was the Judeans who tipped the balance. 
A short time previously, Demetrius had met with Jonathan Maccabee in the recovered city of Ptolemais. The meeting was actually to chastise Jonathan over his treatment of some holdout Hellenizers besieged in a tower in Jerusalem. But Jonathan brought gold, silver, and diverse presents, and things were quickly smoothed over. According to 1 Maccabees, Demetrius confirmed Jonathan as high priest and declared Judea free from tribute, for a one-time upfront payment of 300 talents, which, again, was likely about getting immediate cash for the mercenaries. Both sides were apparently pleased with the deal and concluded a treaty of alliance. Demetrius called the marker back in much sooner than he would have preferred, because as the riots grew and spread in Antioch, he asked for Jonathan to send troops, like now. Jonathan dispatched 3,000 men, who joined up with Lasthenes' mercenary army and began retaking Antioch block by block. But In the course of doing so, things very quickly got very, very ugly. First Maccabees reports that the Jews, in particular, killed a hundred thousand people. They also set fire to the city and took whatever they wanted for booty. The riots were stopped, but at an enormous cost to Demetrius' popularity. Once they were done, the Judeans, per Maccabees, returned to Jerusalem, having great spoils. Right about this same time, Lasthenes decided that staying around was a case of diminishing returns, and he took his men and the money they'd gathered and departed Syria for Crete. And, well, so much for Demetrius' father figure. First Maccabees reports that Demetrius sat on the throne of his kingdom and the land was quiet before him. But it was really the quiet of a young boy king left abandoned in a smoldering ruin. As Granger notes, the only saving grace was that Egypt for a while could safely be ignored, which meant Demetrius could thin out southern garrisons to shore up his hold on Antioch while he started the long, slow process of rebuilding the city. He also directed his first military action, sending word to a Seleucid commander named Ardaya in Babylonia to march against Camnascaris of Elemius. By this time, the aged Camnascaris I had apparently died, and been succeeded by his son, Camnascaris II who'd continued trying to expand Elemian territory. As Granger notes, coins in Demetrius' name were minted in Susa in late 145, so it seems that Ardaya had conducted a successful campaign. It was the first real bright spot since taking power, but the good news wouldn't last long. The Parthians, of course, had yet to be confronted, Demetrius had zero friends in Anatolia, and Egypt might return, when least expected, to resume their ancient rivalry. Most dangerous of all, and still a secret, was Thea's son by Alexander, a key asset in this brave new world of perpetual civil war. If Demetrius had known, he would have killed him. It was just the price of security these days. It was also why he'd kept his own brother, Antiochus, safely away in Sede, to preserve the legitimate line of his father, no matter how bad things got. For the 19-year-old queen Cleopatra Thea, 145 was a year of pretty brutal lessons. The powerful figure she'd pinned her hopes on her father and her former husband, had proven as vulnerable as anyone else to the violent whims of fate. Married once to support one faction, then married again to support their rivals, there wasn't much point in choosing a side when neither could really protect her. 
The takeaway from 145 was that Thea could only depend on herself and would have to do whatever it took to ensure her own survival. Mm-hmm.